Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Stuart Rolt. Thanks. Thank you very much. How's my, is my mic working? Can we all hear? Yes. Great. Um, well, it's lovely to be here. Great honor. Um, I will, I am very aware I'm in the presence of Jaguar luminaries. Uh, some of this evening won't be about Jaguar earlier days and later days, but uh, I know that's really what you want to hear about. But let's start um, when my dad was born on the 16th of October 1918 in a farm in North Wales, St Asaph, North Wales. When I say a farm, they weren't a farming family. They had a very nice farm, but he had driveways and tracks so he could learn to drive at a very young age. And I'm going to go through his racing career, um, and then there'll be a bit of a break, and, and we can move on to other stuff. But the racing career starts properly, if my thing works. There we go. Age 16. Uh, this is schoolboy trials. Um, he represented his school, Eton College. He's the guy, second from right, covered in the rather good leathers. And he, that is a, a single rear-wheel drive uh, Morgan with a Jap engine. And they represented their school. Uh, sorry, that's me. And um, they, were, they, won, they won that event outright. So that was his first real go at motor racing. But he learned his skills on the tracks, at the farm, motorbikes, and that sort of thing. Um, 16 years old. His first motor race was quite ambitious. He went to Spa. And that's him at Spa, uh, at the, having just got his license. First ever event in a Triumph Southern Cross, which he bought. His, he kept persuading his mother to buy him cars, basically. His father had died when he was 13. He was the only son, three elder sisters. They all worshipped him, and he got a lot of uh, favoritism from his mum, which is perfect. Uh, in, the, he was, um, in the Southern Cross, he was fourth in class. And as I say, it's quite a thing to think that his first ever race was at Spa. Um, he moved on, again, mum, I need something quicker. ERA, the thing to have before the war. Um, nice pick in the gleaming ERA, that is Remus. Those of you who know your ERAs will know Remus. He bought it from, uh, they bought it from the, the Prince Bira's family. Uh, Bira was, uh, was down in Cornwall and red, uh, white mouse racing. Um, and they, at the age of 19, he acquired a, rare, a very competitive uh, racing car. He had a couple of races and did okay. Went to Brooklands, hated Brooklands. He just said, boring concrete, round and round. He persuaded Freddie Dixon, the legendary Freddie Dixon, tuner of uh, racing cars of all descriptions, uh, to prepare it for him. And there's Freddy, looking a bit furtive, like he always did. And uh, he, of course, Freddy and my father went on to form Dixon Rolt Engineering, which then became the Ferguson business. And uh, Freddy was a tough Yorkshireman, liked his booze, and his favorite saying to my father was, Tony, slowly with an older woman. <laughs> I never quite understood that. I think I did, anyway. Um, so there he is, and the result was this headline, which was my father winning the British Empire Trophy uh, in 1939, just before the outbreak of war. Just before the outbreak of war. But he was deemed to be uh, the new shining star. Um, and the sort of boy, Tony Rowe with his Empire Trophy, uh, lots of stuff about boy racer. Um, and so the world looked pretty good then. Um, but, and he went to Bern in Switzerland for the Swiss Grand Prix. Uh, and he said he impressed the then 
boss of Auto Union, who were the dominant make, uh, a Dr. Feverison, and uh, Feverison apparently was going to sign him up for a test drive, but then they both ended up on the wrong side of the wall. That's a rather nice pic of my dad as a soldier. He had signed up as a regular uh, officer in the Rifle Brigade. That's what he was. He was a professional soldier. He didn't join up for the war. He was going to make a career of being a soldier. So he went to Sandhurst. He did all that. And at the outbreak of war, he was ready to go. So he had been able to do his motor racing, sort of in spite of being also a regular army officer. Um, the war was tough on him. There he is about to go off to uh, fight. And he ended up in Calais. And I'm not going to do too much on the war, because it's, I could do, I, I, I've done another talk, which is entirely about his war. But he was in charge of things called, Bren, I bring it back to mechanical things, he was in charge of things called uh, uh, Bren gun carriers. Those are Bren gun carriers, track vehicles, quite quick. And he had a, about uh, six of those in his command. And they, they ended up at Calais, and four days later, after a really horrible battle, they were captured or dead. Um, and there is a that's, a, that's a painting by those who like their Jaguar paintings. That's by Terence Cuneo, who also did the famous painting of the 1953 Le Mans winning painting. But it was a horrible three days, and he started his incarceration. And I'm not going to go into the whole story of his incarceration, because tonight it's about his racing career. But what this says is, uh, during the morning, Tony Rolt and Jerry Duncanson arrived up at company headquarters in a couple of carriers. Each had a brain gun carried like a Tommy gun in or under his arms, and each was pre pre prepared to take on anything on earth. Seldom can a couple of more uh, welcome subalterns have reached any harassed company commander. When de joined by David Sladen, the atmosphere was more like a point to point than a battle. It did everyone who saw them all the good in the world to see and hear these chaps. After a few minutes light-hearted conversation, Tony casually remarked that he had really been sent up, for, what he'd been sent up for was to remove all the brain gun carriers and tanks which could be spared, as C and B companies were about to do a counter-attack right round on the left flank to relieve pressure. The fact that he was about to take part in it himself appeared to give him the greatest joy. I like that. So I think that's done the war. My bleeper. Um, that, I, sorry, you can't see it at all. I know you can't. Um, but the only reason I put it up there, it's from Motor Magazine. And in there, there's an, someone's written to Motor Magazine giving an account of my father's time at Calais. That's what that's all about. And it, so if, if you were still taking Motor Magazine in 1940, uh, that's what you had you would be reading about. So that is, I, I put that in because it's a motor piece. Um, this is a letter, um, again from a motor racing point of view, to um, my father when he was a prisoner of war, and it's from a young man. Uh, you don't know who I am, as we have never met, but my uh, my family. The family and I have seen you race at Donington. Um, we, we are so sorry to see you in the times that you have been captured. I hope it is not too awful. Blah, 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 blah. Anyway, it's, it's a lovely letter, which I won't read in full. Um, but it's, 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 it's a, from a fan to him in a prisoner of war camp, which I, must have been rather special to receive. And that's the last, I think that's my last one on the wall. That is his fake <coughs> ID. He used that on his many numerous escapes, but this is one of the escapes where he, and I found that in his papers after he died. So that's a fake ID card made. So when he was on the run, I think he's pretending to be a Polish worker. 
and that's him dressed as a, in an outfit to pretending to be an SS um, uh, man in the camp, and they walked out of the camp dressed like that, five of them. They didn't get very far, but they had a good go. <coughs> That's the glider. And I'm, uh, the glider, for those who don't know, when he got to Kolditz, I mean, Kolditz was very late in his captivity, but he got there, and he was a sort of new boy. A lot of people there a long time. And he uh, thought it would be good to see if we could, they could fly out of this castle. So up in the attic, they built a glider. And that's the only photograph of the Kolditz cock, taken by an, uh, an American journalist. Uh, and then they all left the castle. Everybody went home. And it was probably used as um, firewood by the Germans. But that's it in the attic. And I'm not going to go into how I was going to launch, but I can tell you I'm very glad they didn't launch him with him in it. <laughs> it wasn't going to work. Um, motor racing. Back in from the war, uh, I love this photograph. It's, I'm sorry it's not a bit bigger for you, but it's Shelsley Walsh, and he bought himself this thing called the Alpha Aitken, which had been a twin-engined Alpha, built by Alfa Romeo before the war. He, he took it down to one engine and, and brought it, it was his car after the war to go racing in. And what I love is Shelsey Walsh, there he is with his dapper hat, cigarette in mouth, and uh, it's just a great sort of after the war atmosphere. Okay, Le Mans. Le Mans, I know you all love Le Mans. So his first race at Le Mans was for Rob Walker in a Delahaye, um, pretty slow car but he, he raced it with a guy called J Guy Jason Henry. And they were third at midnight. Uh, this is 1950, by the way. They were third at midnight, um, and then uh, had an engine failure. But the fun thing about this car, it was used by Guy Jason Henry for smuggling watches. And um, he was eventually caught, and Rob Walker nearly had the car impounded by HMRC. Uh, but he got away with it. So that is uh, his first Le Mans. Second Le Mans, uh, he knew Donald Healy well, uh, because Do Donald Healy before the war had been uh, had triumphs, and then he started his own business. And Healy's, so this is a Nash Healy, uh, an American Nash engine, uh, 3.8 litre, six cylinder, three speed gearbox. And they were, in 1950, they were fourth overall. Um, and by that time, he had persuaded um, Donald Healy to let Duncan drive the car with him. And they, that was the start of the pairing between the two. Mm. Um, and then the following year, the, um, sorry, it was the other way around. The first year, yeah, that, that's the same. That's a nice picture in the pits of the Nash Healy, 1950. And this is the following year, they put a roof on it, and they were six overall. They were long note, my father's notes, a long way behind the Jaguars. Um, I don't know if you're pleased about that or not, really. Um, his first Jaguar race was uh, in an XK120 at Silverstone, finished second behind Sterling, and that was pretty good. Uh, and then in 1951, he, he took himself off to Dundrod. Um, which some of you may have been to, um, amazingly dangerous circuit, still used by motorbikes today, uh, for the TT. And it was purely a speculative visit, but Lofty England gave him... Um, sorry, OK, I'll come back to this. I've got slightly, OK, this is... I'll come back to the, the, the um, Jaguar stuff. This is the Alpha Aitken. This is just pictures of him in the car, um, testing and racing. Note, note the crowd control. Uh, Shelsey Walsh. And there's a sort of, that's out of a magazine saying, are these some of our best racing drivers? And then he took the car to Zandvoort, what you were all watching last weekend, I suppose. Anyway, Zandvoort had just started as a circuit, um, and the Dutch were very keen to 
get people there. The BRDC arranged for some of their drivers to go, and he had this epic dice with Bira. In, and, and of course, he was in the, in the Alpha, um, and they, it was a fantastically close race, and Bira just pipped him. There they are. And on that subject, for those who like that sort of thing, there is a book by Neville Hay called Rolt and Bira, The Forgotten Stars, if you like that sort of thing. And you can get it, oh, I don't know where you get it from, but anyway, it's there. It's, and it's got all this stuff in it. Now go on the Christmas list. <laughs> That's a nice shot of the Alpha at speed. And then this is in uh, Ireland. I love that. I love the way the crowd is just there. Uh, he went to Spa in 1948, in a, and he drove an Aston Martin uh, with a man called Andre Pilette. Andre was a very good racing driver who then had a son called Teddy Pilette, who I'll mention later. Um, I couldn't find out where they finished, really annoyingly. Um, but this next one is, the scribble on the side is, is from uh, Andre Pellet to my father saying, to Tony Rolt, the best Alfa Romeo driver in England, which is rather nice. <laughs> <laughs> he drove a thing called an ERA Delage um, for Rob Walker. A beautiful looking car. Um, he loved it, but it was not particularly reliable. But by that time, he was into single-seater racing. It was the first, it's the first uh, single-seater he drove, which what he didn't own. So now he had a drive from Rob Walker. And here is a nice pic of him on the grid, I think a Crystal Palace. Um, and uh, you can just see, I don't know how much you can all see, but Mike Hawthorne, blonde guy, tall at the top of the picture, uh, laughing away. I don't know who the other driver is. And there he is talking to Peter Collins, and that's Rob Walker with the flat hat. So they we're now in a Connaught, um, which he raced extremely successfully um, in, it, in the UK. He had six wins in the UK in that car. That's just a general shot. I think that's Silverstone British Grand Prix. And that's a lovely shot, uh, I think trying quite hard, bit of opposite lock. And that's at Shelsley, I think. Now, I'm sorry, I, I thought the screen would be bigger. So you can't really see what that is. But it's, it, it's the top picture. It's Goodwood chicane. And the top picture has got um, Fangio in a BRM and my father uh, and Ken Wharton in the BRM. He loses it. Uh, father takes to the scenery to try and avoid him. So by the bottom, by the, it's a sequence, sequential. By the bottom, he's off the track at the chicane, and he's into the um, wattle fencing. And the wattle fencing forced the throttle to stay open. And that's, he ended up in the barrier talking to the marshal. This is uh, another sequence, which again, sorry, I couldn't make it bigger. This is him at, I think, Castle Coombe. And he's in the, if you, if you can just see, in the white-nosed Connaught. And the guy on his right is Sterling Moss in a Jap, little tiny little Jap. And somehow they touch. The next thing is, Sterling's turned the car over. He's upside down. And all looks a bit dramatic, was a bit dramatic. And there is Sterling flicking it. And there's my father's car sort of coming straight at him. <coughs> Sterling's rolling out. And now my father's chasing Sterling across the grass. <laughs> um, I think he forgave him for that. I think my father felt quite guilty that he probably did. It's all, you know, there's never room when you come up the inside, is there? Um, right, back to Dundrod. He. He turned up at the 1951 TT and looking, hoping to, to be driver Jaguar. And Lofty England, the legendary, gave him two laps in practice. 
and then he was made reserve driver for Leslie Johnson. Now, Leslie Johnson didn't feel great during the race, so they brought him in, and Dad took over the car, and then set a new sports car record. And so impressed William Lyons that they offered him a drive at Le Mans on the spot there and then. So that's the start of his Le Mans and Jaguar career. By the way, there was never any written contract, uh, neither he or Duncan, and they would share the start and prize money and the expenses. That was it. Prize money was shared equally amongst the team, mechanics, everybody. So it wasn't uh, quite like it is today. Um, 52 Le Mans, of course, you all know, you Jaguar experts, that that was the year of the boiler. They all retired, overheating, and apparently the story was that Sterling had been at the Mille Miglia and had been so impressed by the Mercedes speed, uh, top line speed, that he persuaded them to do something about the cooling um, of the, or the shape of the front of the, of the Jag C-Type. And that, that they then redesigned the front, as you will know, and that caused all cars to retire. This is a picture, a nice picture at Oldham Park in a, a Curia Cross being chased by one Duncan Hamilton. Um, this is a picture of him before the Mille Miglia in 1953. And uh, he was really loved this event and he was determined to do well. And uh, just some stats on this. Um, in, that, in 1953, in a C-type Jaguar, they were averaging 98 miles an hour on those roads for 400 miles. And the, you, you all know that the roads on the Mille Miglia are not all quick. Uh, sadly, the big end seized. And the theory on the big end seizure, now we're into Jaguar chat. Why did the big end seize? Answer, they were a lot of the, the in theory, a lot of the um, circuit, that, a lot of the track, um, the road, was a lot of humpback bridges. And when they took off over the humpback bridges, in theory, the wet sump engine uh, failed them because the car came down and the oil was left in suspension. That's the theory. So the bearings were starved. Don't know if that's true or not. That's the theory that my father was, was given. Anyway, sadly, he went um, very well, very quickly, and was in an excellent position, but retired. OK, here we go. Le Mans, 1953. Um, I don't know much you all know about it, um, but it, for my father and Duncan, it was a, a big moment, um, obviously. The car was fantastic. That year they were, they were lightweight, lightweight, more, more lightweight. Um, they had power up to 220 bhp. The body apparently was paper thin, sorry, gone back. Paper thin bodies, um, Weber carburetors, improved suspension, disc brakes, and now we come to the story of the disqualification, <laughs> which, excuse my French, was bollocks. <laughs> Sorry to say that Duncan wrote a really great book called Touchwood, but you have to take most of it with a pinch of salt. The idea that they were disqualified went into Le Mans town with their wives, my mother, got absolutely hammered, and then were rescued, picked up by Sir William Lyons. They were sort of lying in the ditch, and then he was, he'd bribed the French to take them back in, and they then raced the next day and won. There's so many things wrong with it. First of all, they were never disqualified. They did run two cars with the number 18, so they got a little reprimand from the French, and it was, it was all over. Um, and also, of course, what's wrong with the story is, there were, in those days, there was also a day's gap between qualifying, so practice, and the race. So, and Lofty England is on tape, and I have the tape, saying that was, the story is complete fabrication. But I'm afraid it's gone down in history. So I'm the spoil sport who tells people it's rubbish, um, but people want to believe it, that's fine. Um, but I'm afraid it was just a lovely idea, but rubbish. 
This is um, them walking uh, with Sterling in toward the, before the start. So in the middle, they've got Sterling, the, the smaller one, Duncan, and then my dad in the white. This is a lovely picture of a Lofty holding out the pitch signal at night. This is a great shot of car number 18. Now, you see the way my father's hand is up to his goggles. One of the reasons is because the windscreen was smashed by a bird. So you see the windscreen is not complete. Do you see that? Can you see that? There is the windscreen. Hey. <laughs> Afraid it's got a bit damaged over the years. But those flies on it are the same flies. <laughs> uh, the cellar tape's new, but that is the windscreen. Brilliant. What have I done with my bleeper? It is. Um, I mean, there are so many lovely shots of this car in that race. Um, sort of dawn staring in, again, see the windscreen. Uh, that, that's a sort of dawn, I think dawn. Alec, would you say dawn, not dusk? Yeah. Um, these, are, these are classic C-type photographs, I think. And here are the two heroes and Lofty uh, doing a pit stop. Here is an anxious team looking down the pit straight, including Sir William Lyons in the middle there, white shirt, uh, and, and Len Hayden, Lofty, my mother. And here is, uh, on the right, my, my parents, and Duncan and Angela Hamilton on the left, having won it. And there's a nice shot with uh, Lofty and there's Peter Collins, I think, on the left. And, and, um, and I'm in this photograph because it was the presentation at Coventry at City Hall. And as a small boy, I remember going, and I am there. <laughs> Sorry, there, there's my, that's my sister, Angela. There you go. Uh, moving on, 54, another epic Le Mans race. I'm sure a lot of you know what the story. Uh, the car was quick, everything was good. Um, there were two things. One is the, by the way, these, these D-types were apparently stable in the wet at, on the Mulsanne Strait at 170. It doesn't, it doesn't bear thinking about it, but anyway. Um, but they had a fuel filter problem in all the cars, and they had to come in and change them. And that probably cost them the race, because the, um, in the end, they were beaten by Ferrari, who were stationary in the pits. And the, um, that's a shot of the car, number 14, wet. And they were closing in on the, Ferrari, on the stationary Ferrari in the pits um, when um, suddenly the Ferrari got going again. Now, the Ferrari had a starter motor problem. And they weren't, the driver has to be able to get in and start the engine. Otherwise, you can't go. So what did they do? They put a mechanic under the bonnet of the Ferrari. And they put Gonzalez into the, pass, into the driver's seat, who went sort of, Ugh. And it started. But so the mechanic fixed the starter motor under the bonnet illegally. But Sir William Lyons could have protested. But being the man he was, he said that would be a completely wrong way to win the race. So they didn't protest. And they came second after a fantastic battle, um, which went on right to the very end. But, and there was huge disappointment. They were really were catching fast. Uh, it's worth a good read, that story. And this is two disappointed chaps from a French magazine. Um, 
which is a sort of tells a story of these guys. But I just like the sort of disappointment on the faces, um, having given absolutely everything. Hmm. But they cheered up, and they looked a bit happier by then. Um, staying with the D-Type, back to Dundrod, where they, they had a, a miserable time, engine problems. But that's, I like the shot, and it gives you an idea of what Dundrod is like. Um, and a, a really fantastic circuit. So staying with D-Type, it's 54. And then uh, his last race, uh, well, that's Silverstone, I think, yes. And then his last race was at Goodwood. Uh, he, he raced in 55. Um, but I'm not going to do, talk much about that. Obviously, the um, Le Mans race of 55 was the absolute disaster. But of course, Mike and Ivor Buer won it, um, having kept the cars going. Uh, Dad and Duncan were going very well, and they had an engine problem. Um, I think they were running second when they had an engine problem. Um, and he retired from racing. And um, he retired from racing not because of the crash at Le Mans, but because he had a wife and a boss. And his boss was Harry Ferguson. And Harry Ferguson, the tractor billionaire, was less than keen on his managing director racing these dangerous cars. So my next shot, because we are concentrating on his racing career, is um, driving the Ferguson P99, testing it. Uh, that's at Myra, by the way. Um, and that's with Sterling having won the 1961 Elton Park um, Gold Cup in the, with the Ferguson. And that's testing at Silverstone. My father's the chap with the head chopped off, that's, which I did. Sorry about that. And the, but for those who remember the days, Raymond Baxter on the left uh, looking down at the car. So that's, the, um, that's my bit on his racing career. I, I was asked by a couple of people would I be talking about the Ferguson four-wheel drive stuff. And um, as this was a Jaguar enthusiast evening, I really concentrated on my father's motor racing. Um, and, but, I, but later on, I'm happy to talk about the Ferguson stuff. I haven't got slides on it, apart from the couple on the Ferguson P99. But if people want to ask questions about that, then I'm happy to, to um, talk about that. And I, actually, I will talk about it quite soon uh, in this. So I, uh, my racing career was nothing like my father's. Um, but I was asked to say a few words on it. So I dug out some pictures. And this will be very quick, OK? Um, I'm sure Alec Poole will have words when I get it wrong. Um, so that's the, that was the, um, my last slide on my father. That, that appeared very recently, last year, in the Observer newspaper, um, which so there are still people today wanting to um, recognize my father's story, which is rather nice. I raced Capri's, a great motor car, by the way. Um, so this is me, early days, Oldham Park. Um, British Touring Car Championship, Group 1, as it was called. Um, great fun, competitive stuff. Uh, we had, uh, that's me at Silverstone, TT, um, where we had a bit of success. And this is one for the boys. We've got some sponsorship from Brutus Jeans, who were tied up with, not tied up, sorry, wrong word. Um, <laughs> who had associations with the Playboy Club. So we managed to do a photo shoot outside the Playboy Club in London. Uh, and in case you're wondering, I'm the guy second from left, not the guy, the guy on the right was my friend, Eddie Charlton. Anyway, um, that was for the Tour of Britain. And of course, sitting here is Alec Poole, who created a thing called the Tour Britannia, many, many years later, to replicate it. But the Tour of Britain was great fun. It was, uh, for those who remember, it was races and it was special stages. Um, and, all, and we went on for about four days. That, this car, I, just a, this is quite fun. A couple of shots here. Uh, that's it on a special stage. Um, 
going well. Uh, please look carefully at the car because it changes shape soon. <laughs> uh, that's at Cadwell Park. And this is what happened. Um, at Snetterton, a, another competitor spun in front of the pits, uh, hit the barrier, wheel came off, wheel was bouncing across the track. I tried to avoid the wheel and I hit the pits wall as well. So that's me uh, in the halfway through the circuit, uh, actually uh, halfway through the event. But um, we got it going again, and that's on Epint, hence the um, all four wheels in the air. I don't know anybody here, if anybody here is follows rallying, but Epint is this classic stage, special stage, cir um, stage in Wales. Um, and it's a brilliant place. Anyway, we kept it going. Um, and that's Oldham Park. <laughs> Still going. And we got to the end, and at Mallory Park, about an hour before the finish, a policeman came up to me and said, excuse me, sir, you can't drive that car on the road. And I said, well, we've come all this way. Anyway, we, we were allowed to do it. So we did finish the event. It did look a bit wrecked. Um, I raced at Spa, um, and we managed to finish uh, fourth with a chap called Pete Clark, and I put that, pic that picture in to show just Spa in those days was ridiculously dangerous. People were being killed every year, a 24 hour race, um, and that's just one corner. And there were, in the end, of course, the old Spa circuit with the master kink and all that lot was, uh, has been cut right down, but it was um, ridiculously dangerous, very, very fast, and very, very long. Um, but it was a great event to have taken part in. And we managed to do reasonably well. Uh, that's Pete. Pete Clark, my co-driver, the other driver, lovely guy, Yorkshireman. He was tiny, I'm quite tall, so we had fun when it came to it, sw switching over. And he uh, was, uh, uh, sadly, he was killed flying um, an aeroplane. He was a aero, what are they called? Those guys, aerodynamic, yeah. Lovely man. So, um, Finishing at Spa, uh, that's the TT at Silverstone, where we managed to finish uh, one our class, um, again with Pete Clark. And there's, and there's a gentleman here, Andy, who picked me up this evening, who worked for Gordon Spice, and that's a Gordon Spice car, that Capri. And Gordy was a great mate, um, lovely guy, and I, all, most of my decent Capris were produced by him. Uh, that's the same race. And then I went rallying. Um, and that is Donegal, Alec, uh, in a Nissan Micra. And I found myself, I decided, I, after I stopped racing, I thought, I'd, I'm going to try this rally business. Because my business, FF Developments, was doing a whole lot of rally work. And I found a guy um, who would supply me with a rally car. And that's on, Donny, that's on a special stage on Donegal. And everybody else in a micro was aged about 19, and I was in my 40s. <laughs> and there was a moment when Debbie, who's sitting over there, heard the uh, commentator at a Bilf Wales showground, said, you won't believe the age of this micro driver. He's, <laughs> he's 42. Anyway, uh, we had fun, and I learned a bit. And so I then went, uh, managed to get a, bought a Porsche from Francis Tuthill, local man. That's again on Epint. We managed to win that. Um, and that's in the, that's the Safari Rally in Kenya, which is a fantastic event. We finished third. Um, and that's Epint again. Everything seems to be in the air all the time. And then I bought the Ferguson P99 Formula One car. Um, I bought it from the Ferguson family. And of course, this is the car which my father was completely responsible for creating. Um, and I managed to buy it from them um, and had fun. And that's Goodwood Revival Meeting. Uh, raced it for a few years. We took it to Olon Villar Hill Climb and uh, Shelsley Walsh. Um, and now I've actually decided now not to race it anymore. We've, we've spent enough time and effort on it. Um, anyway, I'm still a proud owner of the Ferguson racing car. And I show this one because way back in my presentation on my father, I talked about a Belgian driver called André Pilette. Hmm. 
So that's, on, that's uh, starting from the left is Teddy Pillet, a very successful Formula 5000 driver, Formula 1 driver. And that's taken at Spa when I was doing the 24 hour race. Teddy was doing the 24 hour race. T on Teddy's right is his father, Andre, who drove an Aston Martin with my father, who is now third from the right, and me. So that's quite a nice pick. Um, and that's it for me. That's uh, my, as you say, as I said, my career is very short. Um, now I'm happy now to take any questions, and uh, including talking about Ferguson four-wheel drive or anything else. But do f fire away. And where's our, my host, Compare? I'm He's lurking some... over here. That lurking. was fantastic, brilliant. Well, let's let's pick up on the Ferguson P99 because, as you say, you own that car now. Mm. Um, just take us back to 1961 when the idea for that car came about. Where did the inspiration for going all-wheel drive in Formula One come from? Do we know? Yep, we know. Well, we know well. Um, right, the story was, immediately after the war, my father st started Dixon, Freddie Dixon, wrote engineering. And they were looking at doing anything advanced in automotive stuff. And one of their ideas was four-wheel drive on road cars, plus anti-skid braking. And Harry Ferguson at that time had made a huge amount of money building tractors. The little grey Fergie sold all over the world in huge numbers. So he was the equivalent to JCB today in his, in his sort of um, salesmanship and his enterprise and what he did. And he said, right, we've done this with tractors. We're going to do, the, we're going to be uh, the game changer in cars. And we, it's got to be advanced. It's got to be safe. Um, and so we're going to build a Ferguson car. And he approached my father, and my father ended up moving to Coventry to be the managing director of a new company called Harry Ferguson Research. And this was to build a road car. And by 1961, they had been um, developing the idea, showing it to the, the um, manufacturers. But Harry Ferguson didn't want to make it himself. He wanted someone else to make it. Right. And uh, um, which he, he did with the tractors. He got Henry Ford to make the tractors in the States. Um, and, and then he had um, is, created a superb new engineering facility uh, at Baggington, at Coventry. Um, put very good people in there, including Claude, Claude Hill of Aston Martin fame. And they were developing the Ferguson road car. And to show the credentials, to show the uh, enhanced abilities of the Ferguson road car, they decided to build a racing car. And that's why the Ferguson P99 came into, into existence. Um, it was designed in 60 by 1961. It then went, at the, it went in three races in 1961. The, British, the first race was the International Trophy at uh, Silverstone um, when they had a, a quite embarrassing failure uh, very early on. Something broke in the, in the transmission. The uh, next race was the British Grand Prix at Aintree. And that was um, quite an interesting story because the car was going well, but being driven by Jack Fairman. Jack Fairman was a good, competent, decent driver. But the car was entered by Rob Walker, who also had a, a person called Sterling Moss racing for him. And Sterling's Lotus retired in the race. And so they brought Jack in to put him in the Ferguson, which was going OK, but not, it had run over a bit of bodywork. It wasn't going that well. Sterling then went very quickly. And Ferrari protested that they had um, push-started the car in the pits, mm. which is ironic after the story about the uh, Le Mans <laughs> yes, 54. The starter motor. Yeah. And so they were disqualified. And um, so then that was the two races in 61, and then um, the Elton Park Gold Cup um, took place, I think, in September. And uh, it was slightly damp, but not all the time. And they won, Sterling won it outright, beating Brabham, Hill, the lot. So that's the story of the, of the P99 in that year. Um, and then it went to do the Tasman series in Australia and New Zealand, driven by 
little-known drivers like Graham Hill and Innis Island, um, where it struggled. It, was, it, 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 it just couldn't quite stay with the quicker Coopers uh, and Lotuses. And that was the end of its um, <coughs> racing career, although they then took the car to Indianapolis to see whether uh, all four-wheel drive could, would work at Indy. Mm -hmm. And actually, it did. And the, 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 then from that, there was a whole generation of uh, four-wheel drive cars produced for Indianapolis. And for about six or seven years, they were all four-wheel drive. Mm -hmm. That led to the famous um, STP um, uh, Novi with the Pratt & Whitney, Whitney helicopter engine alongside, driven by Parnelli <laughs> Jones. And a little bearing broke when they were in the lead, and they, that was, I think, my father's most disappointing moment of his career when that car didn't win the Indy 500. So, and then they banned four wheel drive at Indianapolis. Um, but so there was a whole move to, um, to, to, to the States for that. Um, and then, in, in terms of racing, staying with racing, uh, the idea of four wheel drive in racing. Um, was taken up by L L Colin Chapman, uh, Bruce McLaren, BRM. They all built mm. uh, Formula One cars, but and Matra. And but in the end, they, the two things had changed. One is the regulations allowed huge fat tires for grip, which compared to that car, but you know, sorry, to that car, were nothing. And then also uh, people found out a thing called aerodynamics, and so you had spoilers, tires. And the advantage of four-wheel drive um, was outweighed by the weight and the, the, the um, additional complexity of what you're, what you're driving. Mm. So it, um, it died, basically. Mm. And that actually, I think it's now been banned in four-wheel drive, mm. in, in Formula One. <coughs> so that's the story. Um, it was a period of great innovation in Formula One, wasn't it? It was sort of at the beginning of the, the curve that we saw that even saw six wheelers yeah. coming out onto yeah. the grid. Sure. It's, it's the sort of engineering that we don't see in motorsport anymore. And I wonder, was that more to do with the fact that people like your father, Tony Rolt, were ex-drivers with a bit of flair, a bit more sort of personality that hadn't come through a scientific background and just tried stuff, threw stuff at the wall to see if it stuck. Yeah, maybe. But I, I think that the likes of Colin Chapman were prepared to try everything and did. So the, um, he, he, there was a Lotus of 72 built with four-wheel drive. Mm. Um, and Jochen Rint drove it, John Miles drove it. But in the end, it, it suffered from the same problems, which was it was heavy. Um, so that was the end, um, really, of, of, of it. But th th they were trying everything, as you say, six-wheelers, you name it. Incredible to think that it took Audi 20, 30 years later to bring it to market in a sports car on the road, really. <laughs> well, there's a story on that. I don't know how long we got, but there is an Audi story I have, which was taking this thing way forward. Uh, my father's, uh, in the end, the, Fergus, uh, Har the Ferguson family, uh, Harry Ferguson died in 1960, sadly not seeing the, the Ferguson win its race. But the, the company went on and on and on. Um, but in the end, the Ferguson family said, look, we've, we've invested very heavily in this idea, and it's not happening. Um, there's, a, there's a thing called the Jensen FF was produced, but that was it. Um, there was a very clever design thing called the viscous coupling, which was the Ferguson design yeah. painted by my father. That was great. Um, but in the end, it wasn't making any money. So my father started this tiny little engineering business in Coventry called FF Developments. And we came in just at the right moment when Audi came out with the Quattro. And suddenly, the world of rallying needed four-wheel drive, and we were the people to go to. So we were supplying Lancia, Audi, sorry, Lancia, uh, Ford, and Peugeot, with those, those great Group B days, we were the, absolutely the heart of that. And Audi became a really big customer, because they didn't want to admit, they had a thing called a torsion differential in the middle, and they spotted that the viscous coupling, the Ferguson viscous coupling, was working rather well. And Peugeot had it, won the World Championship. So there was a wonderful moment, there was a Christmas Eve, when I got a call from a man called Dieter Bascher, sitting at, in Coventry at my desk, saying, uh, Mr. Rowe, we, um, we want to come and talk to you. 
we think you have something we want. <laughs> and Audi became our biggest customer wow. for, the, for the Ferguson viscous coupling. <laughs> and not only that, they went on to, um, for their Le Mans cars, for their Le Mans cars, they had um, uh, differentials uh, and transmissions made by us, made by FFD. Brilliant. So that was a great sort of turnaround. <laughs> you had the last lap, we did, yeah. <laughs> no, they were lovely. They became our biggest customer. Yeah. yeah, Amazing. Well, I've got lots of questions. I could sit here all night and ask my questions, but I'm aware that there are questions from the audience that you're bubbling over with. <laughs> Maybe not. To bring forth. So uh, by raise of hands, and I'll try and get them all in, who's got a question for Stuart? Alec at the front there. Stuart, did you, uh, in the 30s, when your dad was at school at Eton, yes. did a teacher take him and his mates to the Nuremberg Ring to, for one of the, to see the Mercedes oh. and Audi, Audis and so on in action? Great question. Um, nearly right, Alec. Spa. Ah. He, this is a, I don't know, um, it's quite a story. He persuaded his, one of his teachers at Eton that it would be a good idea for three of them to hire a private plane <laughs> as you do as you do and fly to spa and he used to say to me that this, that he, he they, they then crept through the wood like you could at spa no barriers and they lay with their noses on the tarmac as these auto unions and Mercedes were going past at 160 yeah good great, great. well remembered I've forgotten that yeah yeah brilliant did you say that P99 competed in Indianapolis, or did it go there? No, it went there for testing. Did just for testing? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but it proved, sort, of, sort of proved the point. Okay. Yeah. Any others? Yes, John at the back there. Yeah. Oh. Could you tell us a bit about the story of the P99? Because you had all the problems with getting the transmission and stuff to work. I seem to remember well, you mentioning so. Well, it's... Quite the, the, the trouble with the P99 is it's the only one. Um, in fact, when, I com when you sort of complete an entry form for a race, you, it's sort of chassis number. And I rather enjoy putting one. Uh, and um, it's, yeah, it's, the transmission is very delicate, very sophisticated, made by an outfit called Colotti in Italy. Um, and we've had all sorts of problems uh, keeping it together. Um, and that's why I've sort of decided to stop racing it, because every year uh, something breaks. And it's, it's sad, but we've had a lot of fun. Um, but I'm going to demonstrate it happily. But um, what I've discovered, and I, I don't know who here competes in historic racing, but people take it very seriously. And um, they, let's say they do modifications to their cars, um, which um, I'm not prepared to do to the Ferguson, because it's original. And I want to keep it original. And uh, so that's why I'm retiring it from racing and will be doing demonstrations. Um, some people, I'm told, uh, if they had a car like the Ferguson, would take out all the original parts, including the engine, put them on a shelf, and then put in all new parts. Uh, all new parts with modern uh, uh, methods of manufacture. Mm -hmm. And then you'd have a bulletproof you know, car to go racing in. But I'm not prepared to do that. Mm -hmm. And congratulations for not being prepared to do that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any more questions um, from the floor? Yes, uh, sir. So you told us about the uh, Le Mans 53, that the story of the drunken night is not true. Is yep. it true about the orange, the float, or, uh, a withered orange floating around the car? Yes, sir, I think that one is true. Yeah, yeah. Good question. That's a man who really knows his yes. 53 Le Mans stories. I've got one as well. Oh, OK. Yeah. Well, with an orange. I've built the orange. Oh, good. Excellent. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Perfect originality. <laughs> I mean, you know, that era of Jaguar is fascinating to all of us here as Jaguar enthusiasts. But um, to go a little bit further back, and you, you talked about his early career as a soldier. Yeah. Was the reason for going into a career in the military because he didn't at that time see a career in engineering? Or what was the motivation of that? I think he, he left school and thought, what the hell am I going to do, and join the army. That was it. I don't, right. think, I don't think at that age he was thinking of an engineering career. I, hadn't, I don't think he got that far. So he just went straight from school to Sandhurst, where he did very well, 
And um, I think, why did he leave the army straight after the war? Probably because his contemporaries had all had um, wars where either they'd been killed or they'd gone on to be commanding their regiments and very successful. But if you were locked up in a prison camp, not much going on there. Mm. He did get two military crosses, one for his efforts at Calais and another for his escaping. So he did, he, uh, people often ask me, why did he escape, try to escape so much? I think he genuinely wanted uh, to get back and to fight. Mm. That's what was driving him. And I think just being locked up was completely against his, um, his character. Mm. Because if you did get caught, which he did get caught, um, you were then put in solitary confinement for, for a month. Not much fun. No. It strikes me watching video of the period and hearing the commentators talking about motorsport then, that death within motorsport lives were kind of just dealt with because they'd had to deal with so much loss through the Second World War. When they came back to motorsport, it was almost a given that you might not come home today. And it almost seems as if they were able to cope with that because of what they'd been through between 39 and 45. Was that sense that you got from your father as well, that it gave him a different outlook on, on life and how he approached motorsport after the war? Um, he was, yeah, well, the story of Calais, his greatest friend was killed at Calais. In, in, you know, they were brother officers. Um, so he had seen death um, firsthand. And then after the war, the, as you say, safety was really tiny. It, mm. was, it, wasn't, it wasn't an issue. And people were being killed all the time. Um, and and, and, and Dundrod was lethal. Lam Dundrod was lethal. Uh, Le Mans was lethal. Um, and the, 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 the Spa was lethal. There was uh, just an acceptance of the fact that people are going to get injured. Mm. And they, but people still raced like hell. Mm. Um, so whether it's to do with the wartime attitude, probably a bit of it. Mm. But then if you think about it, racing remained extremely dangerous for years after yeah. that. And it took the likes of Jackie Stewart <coughs> to really make changes. When you, when you read some of those periods, Formula One particularly, and, and sports car racing, you think of the, what went on um, w you know, well after that period. People were prepared to just do it yeah. and, and take the risk. Yeah. You mentioned in his notes from some of those early races, I think 1950, that uh, he remarked that he was a long way off the pace of the Jaguars. Yes. <laughs> was that? I pick up from those notes, and, and uh, you know, I, I can't help but wonder whether Jaguar was always a bit of an ambition of his. Oh, absolutely! No, when he, when he was driving a, the, the Nash Healy, the Healys, um, you'd see that you know Jaguars were there, and yeah. they were there, and, and so it, it was absolutely his intention to become a Jaguar driver. Because you know he he'd sort of established himself in before the war as quick, mm. um, and then he had to start again. Uh, after the war, with his, bought his own car, ran it, then got um, um, approached by Donald Healy to drive his car. And that was a big moment, because you, you then got someone saying, I believe in you, not just yourself with your own car. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it's, but to drive a Jaguar was absolutely what he wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And it was a big, big moment. Going to Dundrod and, and driving it extremely well and getting that drive with Lofty and William Lyons was, a, was the moment, yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's car 18 that features in a painting in the Royal Automobile Club's members bar. They let me in once, but they wouldn't let me in again. And there's, it's one of the most evocative paintings I've ever seen because it shows um, car number 18, C-type, going through Dunlop Bridge, a bridge that today is floodlit and bright and covered in fairground rides to the left and right of it. Yeah. Le Mans was a very different place in those days, wasn't it? It was rough, it was particularly dark. Did, yeah. you, did he ever talk about just how frightening it was to be behind the wheel of a C-type in those days? He never said it was frightening, but what he did do was talk about how important it was to be quick at night. He was right. very fast through the night stages, through the, through the night period, and he got a bit of a reputation as the man he put in the car for those for, at night yeah. time. Lousy headlights. Yeah. I mean, lousy headlights, lousy brakes. Um, and then the other thing he felt really strongly about, and he wrote a couple of articles um, in magazines at the time, was the speed differential between the slower cars and mm. the faster cars, which was ridiculous. And, and, and 
you know, Mulsanne Strait, they're doing 170 in a D-type, uh, and, and a little Panard is doing 90 or something. Mm -hmm. And so the closing speeds, and that's that, but that stayed the same at Le Mans. Um, yeah. Alec, you've driven Le Mans. And so the, the, the closing speed differential remained a big issue. Still, not, not so much today, but it's, it's a massive thing. Yeah. And he, he felt very strongly about that. He also slightly foresaw the ghastly 55 accident, uh, because he did write a piece about how narrow the road was there with the pits. You know, there's, no, there's no pit wall. It's, you just pull into the pits and stop. Um, and the, road, the car's going by at 150 mm. straight past mm. and, and nowhere to go. That's what caused the 55 the disaster. No, he, he, he didn't. I, I, he, he wasn't. I don't think I ever got him to say what he thought. So we've all read the books, you know, on what, whose fault it was. But um, I do know my mother was in the pits uh, when Mike Hawthorne came in, and he was really, really shocked and had to be calmed down. Either of you have got in the car. That was a very, ba very bad moment, but a very bleak moment in the Jaguar team. Um, my father was still trundling around, and then the car retired. But it was um, a horrific moment. And it's interesting that Jaguar decided to keep, um, we can all have a different opinion on that, but Jaguar decided to keep the cars running um, and won, and Mercedes withdrew. Um, I think these days, obviously, <laughs> there wouldn't have been, the race would have been stopped. Um, but it was, so it was a really, uh, and the, of course, Jaguar won in '55, but it was a very tainted, mm. tainted win, really. Mm. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, Stuart, you mentioned briefly about the Ferguson road car. Yeah. Were there many prototypes? Yes, there were. There were five different prototypes built. Is there one at Gaydon? There is one at Gaydon. Right. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. No, they. I mean, when you think about today, the idea of a new company setting up to build a new road car. That car you're talking about, the prototype, they, they developed their own body. Yeah. The first one wasn't very pretty. The second one was, it looked about like what I call a Renault 16. It, it was quite clever. It was a sort of what you'd call a SUV today, but it was a good shape. They developed their own engine, flat four. They, they did a completely a Ferguson flat four engine from scratch, an automatic transmission from a guy called uh, Count Taramala in, in Italy. Um, ABS, um, and their own bodywork, and of course, all-wheel drive. I mean, that combination, is, that's, that's like Audi 30 years later. That was mm. in the late 60s, wasn't it? Uh, it was in the 60s, it, yeah, 60, uh, yeah, it was, exactly. Thank you. Early 60s and then late 60s, yeah. About technology transferred into the Jensen FF. The Jensen FF took over the all-wheel drive system the, and the ABS, exactly. So the Jensen FF was the first road car to have four-wheel drive and ABS. They didn't make many of them. There was another question over here. Yes, sir. The discus um, differential. Yes. Were they used in Audi road cars or just races? No, they wouldn't put it in the road car. Was no. they, they had the Torsen in the road car. And they were very, very quiet. We were sworn to secrecy that it wasn't, that they put it in their rally car. Um, so the, um, yeah, they, they sort of made a, they made a point of saying the center diff on a uh, road car is a torsen. And the beautiful thing is, once they got keen on it, they had the, our viscous couplings in the center diff, the front diff, and the rear diff. Yeah. And they were, and they were, they would change the settings on the, on them from one rally to another. Um, were they used on any, any other road car apart from the Jensen? The Jensen didn't have a viscous coupling because the viscous coupling came after the Jensen, after the Jensen was made. Uh, the road cars with viscous couplings, yes, lots. Um, Land Rover, Ford, Sierra, 4x4, um, Lancia, Delta, 4x4, yes, lots, yeah, sure. But did Ford Trans have them as well? Ford <laughs> Trans... The, the four-wheel, did you make them for off-road four-wheel drive vans? Oh no, we made we we converted Bedford vans. Oh, Bedford. The early days, we converted Bedford vans to four-wheel drive. One of my first jobs, joining my dad's company, was to go to Yorkshire and demonstrate a four-wheel drive Bedford van to Yorkshire Water Board. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that was career. Successfully. <laughs> yeah. No. 
You know when you've got a car club audience yes. and they ask you about viscous diff? Yeah, vis <laughs> yeah. Well, I can talk all day on viscous diffs, absolutely. <laughs> Any other questions there? I thought there was another hand up. Was that the Bedford Midi four-wheel drive? The small Bedford? Oh, God. I think it was the CF. CF, thank you, Paul. <laughs> I had one, but it was not four-wheel drive. CF, yeah. 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 Are you still with us over here? Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Any other questions there? I've got another question. What, one of the Ferguson stories that's always fascinated me is the, the Monza senator oh, yeah. story for the army and then the subsequent Monzas he made. Can, can oh, you yeah, sort okay. of fill us in on that? God, okay, right. <laughs> yeah, that's a great story, actually. Um, where do I start? So the little, this little company my dad started... Uh, up the, at, at, um, when the Ferguson family had sort of slightly walked away, um, the, the business was basically converting anything we could get our hands on to four-wheel drive um, in the days when most cars were two-wheel drive or rear-wheel drive. And um, the British Army in those days, our army, had a... Um, in, in Berlin, the, the situation was that each country, um, the French the Russians, the Americans, and the British had their own areas, and then they were allowed to... Remember, Berlin, of course, was within eastern Germany, OK? So those, each country was allowed to go outside its territory and look at, observe what was going on out in the countryside, which was basically East Germans and Russians uh, with military vehicles and, and doing exercises. And they, the, the, um, the Berlin operation of the British Army decided that instead of Land Rovers, which were a bit obvious, they would have cars that looked like they were two-wheel drive. So we got a job converting Opel Senators, <laughs> started off with Opel Admirals, and then it became Opel Senators, to four-wheel drive. They were khaki, and they would arrive in Coventry, strip them out, put it in the transfer box, put it in the front axle, uh, 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 change the suspension, send them back to Berlin. That's, and that's how we started with a conversion. And then we ended up c persuading some very wealthy people that they should have their Opel Monzas and Opel Senators converted to four-wheel drive, which we did. Yeah. It cost a lot of money to do it. But <laughs> I bet it did. We did. I bet it did. Yeah. That's the story there. Hey, presumably as well, um, Ferguson had seen car development in his own tractor factory at Banner Lane through the 50s, because that's where, where Triumphs were being developed, the yes. early TRs. So yes. Do you think that had an influence on uh, what he wanted to do with a, uh, with a new road car? I don't think it, was, it, was the, it wasn't the tractor side of it, but he, as a businessman, he always thought it's better to get someone else to make the car. Sure. He didn't want to be in the business of running a factory and making stuff. So, and and the, the plan for the Ferguson car was also always it was going to be built by Triumph. Right, OK. And, 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 they, and they said eventually no, and so he couldn't find anyone else to make it. My father went to America and had a big meeting with Ford, and there was going to be a Ford Mustang four-wheel drive, <laughs> and that was tooled up and ready to go, and then they canned that. That was one of his most disappointing hmm. moments when Ford said they're not going to build a four-wheel drive Mustang. And they converted four prototypes to four-wheel drive, um, and they were fantastic, you know. 4.7 litre Mustang four-wheel drive was quite quite a thing. So that the, the 54 Le Mans disappointment and Ford saying no to the Mustang <laughs> were his two big disappointments. Uh, they were up with each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any more questions from the floor? Yes, sir. How does the current four-wheel drive vehicles differ from the original concept? Mm, not Really? No. I mean, you, you, in the end, you're, always, you're just adding a pair of driven wheels. And you can do that by starting with... The, 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 I mean, if Lancia started with a front-wheel drive Delta, and then we, you know, we put the prototype, we just put a back axle in and drove it. But you've got to change the bodywork, you've got to change the chassis, you've got to change the suspension. But the idea of adding another set of pair of driven wheels doesn't really change. And no. the front wheels, you know, steering, that technology? Which, which technology, sorry? To, to drive steering wheels. Um, so you've got the universal joints or whatever. Yeah, but that's, that, that's now sort of standard stuff, yeah. if, if you think about it. The, the, the way a front-wheel drive car is driven yeah. is not that 
that hasn't changed for a long time. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, no, the major change is you're adding weight, um, and you're, you've got to get, you've got to make room for this stuff you're putting in there. Yes, sir. So what was your relationship like with your father, and was he around when you started your own recent career? Who's asked that question? Thank you. <laughs> it's very bright. I can't, it's quite <laughs> difficult to see. My, oh, that's a nice question. Um, my relationship was, was um, he was very supportive of my racing career. Thank you. Uh, he was, he, 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 didn't, he wasn't sort of, the father saying, come on, my boy, you're going to be a world champion. He said, if you want to have a go at this, that's fine. I'll, I'll advise you um, and support you. And um, by that time, he had started his own little uh, engineering business, so he was able to get the cars prepared for me. Um, no, it was lovely. It was a very happy time. Thank you for asking that. It was, it was great. Um, and, he, and he enjoyed it. I mean, that moment at Spa um, with seeing Andre Pellet and that sort of thing, he loved all that. Um, it was it was great. Um, very happy memories. Thank you. What age were you when he died? And how old was he? Uh, he was uh, 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 Debbie. Help me. He was. He was ninety-one. I was going to say he was, an 80, he was eighty-nine. He didn't make yeah. it. Yeah. So well, it, uh, okay. You're asking me what, what age I was when he what died. I can't do the maths, but I was born in 1949. And he was born in 1918, and he died when he was 89. <laughs> are there any Healy Nashes left? Or? I don't know where they are. I think there are. Yeah. Oh, there are. Yeah. You don't see the racing. No, I know. And so actually, the gentleman there, who's a triumph whiz, um, came up to me. It was I, I, my son Freddie sent me a thing yesterday saying the uh, triumph Dolomite. Triumph Dolomite, which Dad raced um, at, uh, before the war, straight eight, straight eight um, is was on the market, and I was sent it by my son. I said, "Look," and it says, "Driven by Tony Rolt." Um, and I rang Fiskins, who were selling it. They said it had already been sold. And my friend here said he thought he heard it went for two million. Yeah. yeah. Well, you just hearsay. Hearsay. Yeah. Yeah. Could be true. Yeah, it's, it's a very beautiful car because Donald Healy uh, was running, he was running Triumph? Yes, he was Triumph. And um, before the war, and he, they copied the um, Alfa Romeo 8, mm. 8C. 8C, stunning car. And they just, I don't know, you, could, you, you sort of could do that today, but they just copied it completely and called it a Triumph. Yeah, he actually um, bought one, didn't he? Did he? Yeah, he bought an 8C, there you brought go. it over, yeah. and, and, and crashed it into a train. Did he? During the time he was trying oh, to right. work out how good it was. That. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think on the Mealy Mealy, he crashed it into a train oh, or on, on a level crossing oh, or right. something, yeah. But suddenly the waterfall grill that those Dolomite straight eights became famous for was, was from the Alfa Romeo sort of design cues from that period. Yeah, so, very, yeah. Be very beautiful car. Fantastic. Monte Carlo. Monte Carlo, was it? Right. Yeah. Oh, come on. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yes, I, I, we saw three of those together at the RAC Club when they launched the book recently, which is a phenomenal oh, right. sight oh, to see oh, okay. three of those cars together. Right, so, I need to yeah. get more knowledge about Triumphs. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're expensive, though, I think. <laughs> yeah. Was the one which was sold your father's car? Yep. It was? Yeah. Well, it's one he raced. Yes, right. yes, it was. Yes, it was. Yeah, yeah. And how many did they make? Uh, it's debatable whether there were two or three. Oh, I see. That's yeah. right. The, uh, the one that was crashed by Donald Healy on the uh, Monte Carlo was uh, made up into two cars. Yeah. All right. And I believe your father was uh, racing uh, both during the 37th season. Right. I think that's right. Reconstructed by a company called uh, High Speed Motors. Uh, I think your father was involved with both of the reconstructions. I think you're right. In fact, I've got, I've got, some, note, I've got some notes here which we can talk about afterwards. I, yeah. I think you're dead right. Yeah, one was turned into a Corsica with a beautiful body right. and that was exported to uh, the States. And I believe it's back in the UK now. So, so it proves there's no such thing as an original car. Not in racing cars, you know that. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> Except the Ferguson P99 is original. <laughs> 
We're a great night out when we get together. You I can, can tell. That. Yeah. You must have the girls loving it. <laughs> when we go to Goodwood Revival and events like that, Silverstone Classic was just a couple of weeks ago, and we see the C types, the D types, some of which are genuine, some of which are tributes now. Um, we, you know, we all enjoy watching those cars, but for you, having um, grown up around a father who raced them in period, that period that we celebrate so much today, what should we understand that perhaps we don't understand, um, having not had your perspective, about what it was to drive those cars and be in motorsport at that period of time, do you think? Oh, God, that's a big question. Um... Uh, I, I think it goes back slightly to what we talked about earlier, which is that um, there was a sense of what the hell, let's do this thing um, attitude. And people were fiercely competitive and they really wanted to win and they were prepared to take risks to do so um, in a way that these days would be seen to be slightly bonkers mm. um, in t just the, the risks they took. Um, was but the, but my father, if I can just talk about him, he was very uh, professional. Um, he was, in fact, I got a. I know you've asked me. Bad luck. You're gonna have to get an answer. Um, <laughs> he he. Um, I got a piece here. This is written in 19. Um, sorry. You can edit this bit on the film. I was hoping at some point you were going to pull out the leotard and the yeah. pom-pom tail as well to show um, them one of the other pictures. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I, I remember one, this is a journalist in 1955. I remember once querying with Tony why he had never regarded Nuvolari as one of his idols and examples. The, the reply was typical. If I try hard enough, I might emulate Seaman or Caracciola. Caracciola. But that little man, never. He's just a miracle. While all drivers bear some resemblance to Jekyll and Hyde, I can think of few who offer so many conflicting characteristics as does Rolt. One might be forgiven for thinking, of, thinking him a very young playboy because of his very boyish enthusiasm only to be confronted with his incredibly serious approach to the technical and strategic problems of driving. Although he drives with ruthless determination as far as he himself is concerned, he has not sacrificed his fundamental belief that motor racing is a sport. It's that ability to balance professionalism with having fun that perhaps we've missed from motorsport for some time. Would you agree with that? I think there are a lot of people having a lot of fun in motorsports still. Yes. I'm not too worried about that. Yes. I think it's still got some terrific people in it <laughs> having a very good time and spending a huge amount of money. Absolutely. Well, I think that's a good place to end. Of course, yeah. Stuart's no, here if you want to. No, 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 no. Um, I'm Stuart's mate. This is Alec Poole, who used to, he used to race a bit. Yeah. A bit. <laughs> and he used to drive rally cars with Paddy Hopkirk, and you can't believe they sat in the same car together. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> shush, shush, shush. Just, I, sorry, just firstly, from, from all the guests, thank you very much. That was fantastic. Okay. <laughs> wait, wait, wait for it. I just, re just remembered sitting there that, you know, sometimes. We went, when you had a few sherbets on a Sunday afternoon and you're looking through the registration numbers for sale and you think, oh, that would be a nice one or there's my name or maybe I could move, you know, move a, a four into a, 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 an H. Anyway, doesn't it? But years ago, I saw, I thought, ah, oh, I looked up uh, P99 FFG and I bought it because it was there for a pittance. And I, it's a little prezzy, mate. What? Yeah. <laughs> How about that? That's Fantastic. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I had forgotten about it, actually. <laughs> but I've I got the old cert and all oh, that I stuff for you. Oh, but I was waiting you. for you to invite me to a party oh, okay. or something like that. The big prezzy for you. <laughs>
Anyway, that's very kind. How about Brilliant. that? Thank okay. You. Thanks. That's a great, great thing, yeah. that is. That's lovely. Thank you, Alec. The question is, what car is it going to go on? I know. That's a very good question. How much are you going to ask for? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 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 It's on film. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's on film. Well, Alec was stood behind the lights. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Brilliant stuff. Well, Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Stuart Ross.